You know, if the Megami Tensei series is anything to go by, the future's some scary shit. We got nuclear wars, demon invasions, dimensional portals appearing in the Arctic. It's safe to say, things aren't looking too good. Of course, some of the biggest problems can be those that lie in wait, blending in with our surroundings and sinking in their teeth just when we let our guard down. It doesn't always take an apocalypse to cause some heavy damage. This is the exact kind of problem we're going to face in Devil Summoner Soul Hackers. Released two years after the original Devil Summoner in 1997 for the Sega Saturn, Soul Hackers takes another dive into a shadowy world of conspiracies and mysterious organizations, this time with a cyberpunk setting in the futuristic Amami City. Over a decade later, it was officially released on the 3DS in 2013 in the United States, with a few tweaks and some extra content. That's right, this is the first game I'm reviewing that you can actually play in English without installing some kind of translation patch. Just don't expect to get a physical copy without paying the price of a black market organ. If you're familiar with the original game, or maybe you've played the Raido Kuzunoha games, you already know that they bleed style and personality, with each title featuring memorable casts of characters, fun designs, and immersive settings. So, does Soul Hackers live up to the original? Are the mechanics still enjoyable for those accustomed to modern RPGs? And how does it stack up against some of the more popular Mega Ten games? We're going to take an in-depth look at the entire game, from the core mechanics to the dungeons and bosses, and see it all. Normally, I don't put spoiler warnings on these kind of videos because of how old the games are, but because this one is sorta of recent, be warned that I'll be showing pretty much everything about the game's plot and post-game content. With that out of the way, let's take a step into the future and get started. Everything opens up with an introduction to Omami City, a so-called cyber metropolis that's fully integrated into its own online network. A newswoman talks about the upcoming release of a virtual city called Paradigm X, created by the company Algonsoft. Everyone wants in on that shit, and the company can't keep up with the amount of people registering to try it out. The odds of being selected as a beta tester are pretty low, but fortunately for us, we're a member of a small hacking group known as the Spookies, and we're gonna find our own way in. Before the news broadcast has a chance to end, we're down on the street with our friend Tomi, hacking our way into the database and swapping out someone else's Paradigm X credentials with our own, which provides us with a chance to input our character's name. It's a smooth intro that, like the original Devil Summoner, does a great job of gearing up your expectations for what the city and overall atmosphere are going to be like. Whereas the first game sort of eased you into the role of a rather plain, everyday guy in a sort of sleepy, nostalgic seaside town, this game right away thrusts you into the rebellious mindset, showing right off the bat the kind of underground activity that goes on in the supposedly flawless city. After we finish up, a weird voice calling itself Keynap speaks to us from inside the screen of this terminal, urging us that we're in danger and that we'll meet again soon. Of course, for now, this gets brushed off as a prank, and we head back home to meet our sister Tomiko. One pretty big thing I haven't mentioned yet is that this game has voice acting, which as you probably know, is kind of rare outside of the franchise's 3DS games. To be honest, I really like it. I know a lot of people think English dubs can be pretty hit or miss, but this one's solid in my opinion. If you don't agree, there's also the option to just turn off voice acting. I'll talk about this a bit more as we continue to meet characters. So, we meet the family, talk a little about Paradigm X, and check our messages, seeing a notification that the Spooky's HQ has been moved to a nearby parking garage. That's our next destination. If you're feeling up to it, you can look around the city a bit, talk to some people, and even enter a few shops. Not much is available to do just yet, but it doesn't hurt to familiarize yourself with a couple of the game's main areas. At the parking garage, a sick-ass trailer pulls in and we meet Masahiro Sakurai, the leader of the Spookies. You talk about the encounter with Kinap, and Hitomi seems a little freaked out that someone's out there who could track us that easily, to which leader asks if she's always acting like this. Now, when describing Hitomi's personality, this might seem like an innocent dialogue choice, but it's not. Pay attention to this one. Most, if not all, of the dialogue choices that we've seen so far are pointless, just there for role-playing, and for most of the game that's also true, but this one is important. The way you describe Atomi's personality actually determines what skills are learned by a party member we'll be meeting pretty soon. Describe her as more upbeat, and you'll get a fire and expel build. If you say she's calm, you get ice and death skills. 
Finally, for my personal favorite and the option I see recommended by a lot of people, saying that sexy defines her creates an electric and almighty build. I actually didn't know about this until afterwards, but I can vouch for the effectiveness of the sexy build. If you have a preference and you're really into team building, be sure to keep this in mind. Afterwards, Leader shows us a gun type PC that he found, which if you played the original game is going to look pretty familiar. He says that ever since finding it, he's been followed by suspicious figures, introducing us to the first thread of a giant conspiracy. After that, he heads out and we're on our own for a bit. While we're waiting for everyone to get back to base, let's take a look at Paradigm X. After a quick little intro video that ends with the guide explaining that we're gonna have our asses blown off by the absolute intense visual quality of the city, you get dumped into the place. And to be honest, it's kind of fucking unnerving in here. What is this, Silent Hill? The sky is this dingy grayish brown color, the streets are cold and lifeless looking. This place is depressing as shit, but the music is pretty happy. That being said, I mean, yeah, it does look like a city, and it is just the beta version. I feel like the whole place has a very dreamlike quality to it, I mean, check it out. You can walk into a building and all of a sudden you're out on the beach. Another place is just a bunch of dudes standing around in a bathhouse with suits on, and then you're by some hill during sunset where a girl says that being nice is a pain in the ass. It's just a whole mashup of different places and people, and the way some of these more vibrant areas contrast the dead city outside gives everything an aimless, dreamy feel. If you head to the theater, you get even more options like a VR haunted mansion and an art gallery. Now out of curiosity, I checked out the art gallery, and that shit was even more surreal than the outside. It's big, empty, kinda dark, and the music is... kinda sad. If they were going for an unfinished, sinister sort of feel with Paradigm X, I'd say they damn sure accomplished it. It actually kinda reminded me of Shin Megami Tensei 9, which is something I never thought I'd say, but hey, I guess there's a first for everything. Moving on with the story. Eventually, Hitomi spots something up in the sky, which turns out to be an announcement playing on a screen. The executives of Algonsoft talk about how every house in the city is connected to the network, and everyone's receiving free computers. Check out this guy, Nishi. Yeah, he definitely doesn't look like the villain or anything, right? It's safe to say, we're gonna see this guy again. Now on our way out, we meet another strange voice, this one screaming about wanting souls. Some weird shit happens, we like, pass out and get stuck in the computer, and when we wake up, we're face to face with a coyote. Now don't worry. This is Keenap, and as it turns out, he's on our side. He just saved my ass. Keenap warns that the city's in danger as an evil force is stealing souls. To prepare us for understanding what this means and to help get to know him better, Keenap proposes that we embark on a vision quest. So hey, why not? Just another day in Paradigm X, right? Vision quests are, as Keenap says, a journey into the past. These allow you to explore things about the world through the eyes of other characters, playing as them for a bit and experiencing some of the last moments of their lives. The vision quests are one of my favorite parts of the game and bring some of the coolest moments of the entire thing. They're also atmospheric as shit. Our first vision quest brings us into the shoes of a man named Urabe, driving down the highway at night with his gun type comp lane on the seat. Come on, you know this is cool as hell. Urabe is on a mission to retrieve some data from the computer room of none other than the Algonsoft building. He pulls up, walks right through the front door, and detects demons on his radar. And that's our introduction to the game's first dungeon. Now like I said, if you played the first Devil Summoner, or really any first person Megami Tensei game, this is gonna feel very familiar. The game logically plays a lot like its predecessor, and it's actually quite a nice experience on the 3DS. As you explore, you slowly fill up the map on the bottom screen. During the vision quest though, and in some buildings, the map is automatically filled out for you. I'll continue to talk about this as we move through the game, but I really like the dungeon design in this. As you explore this building, for example, well, it actually feels like you're exploring a building. What I mean by this is that in some Megami Tensei games, whether you're in a cave, an office building, or inside a monster's stomach, it all just kind of feels like an afterthought with the dungeons taking on whatever form they'd like without really taking the setting into account. With this game though, the design and challenges you face in each dungeon tend to be pretty logical, and each level is generally a pleasure to explore. Now, as Urabe, who is already himself an experienced summoner, we've got some demons in our party to work with. 
Just like in all the classic Mega Ten games, as you walk around with Demon Summoned, you use up Magnetite, one of the game's two currencies. Urtube has quite a lot of Magnetite and he's quite strong, so overall, there's not much to be worried about as you're exploring. Honestly, placing you into the role of a stronger character to get used to the game is a great idea, and it gives you a minute to really experiment with a balanced party before you're left to figure out the rest later on. Speaking of demons and Magnetite, before long, you'll experience your first enemy encounter. Let's talk about the combat system for a bit. This game uses a row system. You got three spots for party members in the front row and three in the back. Depending on where you place your team affects things like how likely they are to be attacked and what abilities they're best off using. Certain enemy attacks may also hit specific spaces, like maybe it only hits front, middle, and back left, or something like that. As you figure out what different enemy attacks do and what rows they hit, you can switch your guys around and work to create an optimal team layout that works for your strengths and weaknesses. The same is also true for the enemy team, so you need to pay attention to what rows your attacks are going to hit when you're prioritizing an attack, for example, on a particularly strong beaming. It's a pretty good system, and if you're used to press turn or something from newer games, it might feel dated, but I actually really like the six party system, and I'd love to see another newer Mega 10 game use it again. Negotiation, the series mainstay, works basically the same as you'd expect. You talk to guys, give them money and magnetite, and answer some questions. Some of the negotiations are actually pretty funny, and some even directly relate to things happening in the plot or the character you're playing as. This game also brings back the demon loyalty system. Now some like it, some hate it. Learning the intricacies of the demon loyalty system took me a while, but I ended up becoming really fond of it. Essentially, each demon has a personality type, and that affects how it will react to the orders you give it. For example, a kind demon will love it if you ask it to heal your party, but if you ask it to attack the enemy team, well, it might tell you to shove that up your ass and just ignore you. If it sounds annoying, well, it can be, but it also adds an extra layer of strategy to your team builds and combat. In most Megami Tensei games, demons thoughtlessly obey everything you say, which doesn't necessarily take anything away from the experience, but it can make them all feel kind of the same. The loyalty and personality systems flesh out each of the demons a bit more, and to me makes it feel more like a living entity that you're working with rather than just a minion carrying out your orders. Eventually, as you climb through the building and start to get a feel for the game's core mechanics, you reach the computer room. Urube grabs a program off a computer called Namisa, which is so big that he has to delete the rest of his demons to make room for it. As he takes it, the program seems to laugh at him a little bit, but before he has time to react, Urube gets interrupted by someone else. This is Finnegan, and he shit-talks us, calling us a traitor. He's kind of a dick, and it seems like they're about to have a duel, except, well, Urube deleted his demons. After a brief chase scene, Urube ends up on the roof of the building. With nowhere left to run, he locks his comp, which is pretty sick because you actually get to choose the password, and throws it off the roof of the building. Unfortunately, Finnegan catches up, and it's the end of the line. On the bright side, we did learn about where the gun comp came from, the data that's on it, and even the password. With that, we wake up to Hitomi losing her shit. Without skipping a beat, we stand up and pull out the comp. Hope you remember the password you made up. As the comp unlocks, a big ass ball of light pops out and slams into Hitomi, seemingly taking over her body. She looks a little different, huh? This is Nemissa, the demon that's been trapped inside this comp for quite a while. She's perhaps one of the most iconic characters of the entire franchise and a damn powerful party member that we'll be working with for the rest of the game. You might expect this scene to be kind of frustrating, like your best friend is having her body taken over by a demon and they're both fighting for control, but it's actually pretty lighthearted. Hitomi doesn't seem that mad about it actually. While this is going on, the rest of the Spookies gang shows up. Here we meet Six, the gun nut of the group who's also kind of a big baby, and Lunch, the master at modding hardware. They kinda notice that Hitomi's different, but they don't pick up on the fact that she's been possessed and I guess the character we're playing as doesn't mention it either. After a bit of talk, we get a call from Leader. He's at the Algon NS building and he talks about seeing monsters. Looks like we gotta go help him out. Nemissa tags along too because why not, some crazy shit's going down and she might as well join in. Let's get right on that. Well, as soon as you step in, it's again gonna look familiar. It's the same dungeon from the Vision Quest, so you should generally know your way around. Of course, we're a little lighter on resources this time, less magnetite and money, and naturally, no demons. If you're feeling a little adventurous, try recruiting someone when you get the chance. It's nowhere near as hard as the original Devil Summoner, where for much of the game I just went solo. Instead of the roof, in this dungeon we're going to the basement to find Leader. 
When you hit the bottom, you hear someone behind a door. Step in and you see what is possibly the coolest man to ever be placed into a video game. Carol J, a member of the Phantom Society. He might look like a pretty chill guy, but as it turns out, he has no problem with killing us. Unfortunately for him, we have Nemissa, so he's got no shot. Carol J is a pretty basic boss. Just make sure you cast some healing spells or use some medicine items when needed and you'll be fine. Like I mentioned before, I had Nemissa's electricity build, and that shit just obliterates people for most of the game. Here, it'll one-shot most of Carol J's demons. After he goes down, he drops a note on the floor and we've saved leader. I really like that nobody seems to notice that Hitomi is just totally different, or if they do notice, they must just chalk it up to teenage hormones or something. Nemissa's over here like, yeah, that was the easiest shit I've done in my life. She's self-aware that she's absolutely OP, and everyone just kind of shrugs it off. Her voice actor really pulls the character together, and for me, it just made all of her scenes really entertaining. After the dialogue, you get a chance to allocate some skill points. You probably leveled up already by now, but let's just talk about this for a second. The stats are Strength, Intelligence, Magic, Endurance, Agility, and Luck. Just like most other Mega 10 games I've talked about, it's a good idea to invest in Strength, Endurance, and Agility for the main male character. Our character can't cast spells, so the other ones won't do much good. For Nemissa, it's basically the opposite. For her, devote points to Intelligence, Magic, and Agility. With these builds, you'll be totally fine for the entire game. Back at base, Spooky talks about how he was investigating the gun-type PC when he heard a rumor about it being related to Algonsoft. He snuck in and got kidnapped afterward. We also meet another member of the Spookies, Yuichi. He's kinda like the cornball dude and he's pretty cool, I guess. The note that Carol J dropped also gives us access to SummonerNet, where we can get info about what's going on behind the scenes in the city. The team decides to investigate the mysterious Phantom Society using the gun comp and summoner net as clues. As everyone's talking, the comp starts glitching out and displays a message to visit the Goma Den. That's gonna be our next stop. At the door, we're stopped by this odd girl named Mary. She tries to shoo us away because we don't belong there, but then a friendly face steps in and clears things up, realizing that since we have a comp, we must be real summoners. Nah man, we just found this shit on the street. We don't need to talk about that though. This is Victor, a cool looking guy that you might remember from other Devil Summoner games. His place is going to be where we fuse demons, so it's going to be one that you frequently return to. He offers to fix our comp in exchange for a favor. Classic shit. So with no other choice, we've got to head to the Amami Bay Warehouse District and grab something for him out of a cold storage warehouse. Definitely not suspicious. Now that we're kind of getting involved in the world of summoners, we got full access to the other shops throughout the city where we can get weapons, armor, and other items. Make sure you regularly check these places out, it's nice to have some reliable equipment. Some of the best stuff can actually be found in dungeons, but it doesn't hurt at all to upgrade every now and then before trying a new dungeon. The warehouses are to me like the first real dungeon of the game. If our little adventures at Algon NS were just the tutorial, then this is your first challenge. You gotta go around through the warehouses, find access codes, and even bother a guy for some suits that are warm enough to let us walk around inside the cold storage. Like I mentioned before, I really like how the gimmicks of each dungeon match up with their settings. When you're in this dungeon, you really do kind of feel like you're sneaking around trespassing in a place you shouldn't be. The cold storage warehouse itself is actually pretty huge, and I was surprised for such an early dungeon at how big it was. Some of the early dungeons in the first Devil Summoner were pretty compact little places with a gimmick thrown in, but here you get a big multi-floor dungeon. It's nothing too complicated, so just make sure you keep your health up and manage your resources effectively. As you're exploring, Nemissa mentions that maybe it's a little too cold in here, and that a demon is likely causing the extreme temperature. It's always some shit like that, man. The demon in question mentions that it's being ordered to protect the place by Master Thrill. Oh yeah. If you saw my video on the first game, you know exactly who I'm talking about. This fucking guy. Anyway, let's take care of the demon first. Well, there's another not too hard fight. You might even have a demon with bust spells by now, so if you do, make good use of those. It's not required, but it can never again hurt to have an extra bit of attack or defense. The boss uses ice spells, so watch your weaknesses. If you have the special suits equipped from that guy earlier, then you automatically resist ice. With that out of the way, let's go meet our old buddy Thrill. He's lurking around in some lab upstairs. You know, I never thought I needed to know what this guy would actually sound like, but this game answers the forbidden question. To be honest, seeing characters like Thrill and Victor return in this game is pretty great, 
And it's crazy to think that since Devil Summoner 1 was never localized, so many of these return appearances just had to go over people's heads who weren't aware of it. Anyway, Thrill hates summoners, they're always messing up his day, so he runs away. So we grab the item we need for Victor and come back. Now this thing is the Dolly Cadman, and it unlocks a special type of fusion called Zoma Fusion. I didn't touch this at all in the original game, but in this one I did get some use out of it, and it can be pretty helpful. Essentially, you fuse demons to this doll, and it creates a perfectly loyal demon who retains many of the spells of the ones you used in fusion. If you're looking for a demon with a specific moveset, essentially you can use this to create your own. Back at base, we read a message on the summoner net from Carol J, who mentions a special live performance at the Astrology Museum. Leader mentions that this is a great opportunity to see what he's up to and get more info on the Phantom Society. Us being the crazy demon summoning teens we are, we decide to go check that shit out. The Astro Museum is another pretty solid dungeon. The big gimmick with this one is that you actually need some knowledge of constellations, so if you're big into the horoscope shit, you're gonna really fly through this one fast. As you explore, you'll find different exhibits that you can read that give you basic information about constellations, and you'll want to write it down or commit it to memory for later. The enemies also get a bit tougher here, I actually died a couple times due to some bad luck with status effects and stuff like that. It's a decent place to gather experience for a bit if you have some time to kill. Nemissa will also learn a party-wide healing spell around this point of the game, so be sure to have that too. To progress to the end of the dungeon, you have to enter the quiz room where you'll answer some questions about the zodiac. Get any of them wrong and you get kicked out of the room. When you're done and you've answered all five correctly, the way forward is open. In the back of the museum, we run into Carol J again. Love this guy. This time, he's trying to summon some kind of angel to kill us, but it doesn't exactly work out for him, and instead, an ancient evil possesses him. Nice. Even to miss a laugh, I mean, what kind of weak-ass person ends up being possessed by something they summon, right? Oh, wait. Uh, yeah, that's right. We did that. Anyway, this guy's called Muwis. What a name. He looks like some kind of bionicle with a tumor growing out of him, but don't underestimate him. He actually ripped my face off the first time I fought him. As always, buffs are helpful, and you might even want to step out of the museum for a minute and make use of the fusion we recently unlocked. I was using some old demons during this fight, stuff from the very first dungeon, so just a few quick upgrades can make the battle a lot easier. Go hard with Nemissa's spells, and make sure your demons are free of any status effects, and you should be fine. After it's over, Carol J is all sad and decides to retire because he's just not as cool as we are. I kinda expected this guy to be one of those villains that comes back throughout the entire game, but no, this is pretty much it for him. Apparently late in the game you can run into him on the street as a normal NPC, but I never saw that in my playthrough. So I guess this is farewell to Carol J, Mega Ten's greatest villain. Godspeed. After Muwis' defeat, he looks for a new body as a host and actually goes into Numissa. She disappears, and then you get a phone call from Hitomi. Somehow, she and Nemissa ended up in Paradigm X. Head back to HQ, and sure enough, there she is on the screen. Somehow, this whole thing gave Nemissa the power to enter the computer, and she doesn't really seem to be phased by the whole possession thing, so hey, that's cool. She drags us in with her next to check it out. Instead of some kind of terrifying shit waiting for us on the other side, we actually just end up going shopping for a minute. Nemissa decides that her current clothes are awful and tacky, and decides to buy some new ones in here. This is where she ends up getting that iconic outfit, which looks cool as hell by the way. Back out on the street, we run into a floating rabbit. It's Keenap again. He seems to know Nemissa, but won't explain anything further. He invites us back to the theater for our second vision quest. That's kind of fast, huh? Feels like we just did our first one. I really like that actually. This game flips up the gimmicks and action quite a bit, so things don't have much time to stagnate before you're doing something totally different. The next vision quest puts us into the role of Judah, a dark summoner. Look at this guy, come on, the sax, huh? You know he's badass. He's on a mission to the Amami airport to take care of a demon for none other than Nishi of Algonsoft. Just like last time, we're given a decent bit of money, magnetite, and a full party. Judah's tough, so you're not gonna have any trouble here. As you explore, keep your surroundings in mind. Just like the Algon NS building, we're going to be back here later, except the map won't be filled out for you, so the more you remember, the easier it'll go. You start out the quest by trying to manually disable locks to get deeper access to the building, which takes you on a little hunt across most of the building's floors. As you explore, you'll meet other summoners, most of which are passive-aggressive or outright mean. Jude is a master summoner, and basically you can give them lectures if you want, which teach you things that you don't know yet about the demon loyalty system, 
But because these guys were so mean, I just flat out refused to give them hints, which meant I missed out on some important information, but at least I kept my dignity. Eventually, you walk into a control room and oh my shit. You know who this is, right? Oh yeah, it's Ray Reho, one of the protagonists from the first Devil Summoner game. Remember, Judah is a dark summoner, so we aren't on the same side as Ray. And you'll realize that pretty quickly because soon you're fighting her. Ray absolutely beats your face in and she dodges almost every attack, so you don't even get to feel like you stand a chance either. She's not a monster though, so she does spare a life for now, and even urges Judah to reconsider his path in life. I gotta say, it's pretty cool to see what it's like to be the enemy of a summoner like that. Just like Nemissa, Ray demolished shit in her game, so you can only imagine how bad it'd be to have to go up against someone like her. Nonetheless, Judah decides to continue on, so we explore a bit more of the dungeon. He does start to doubt himself though. At the end, we reach a big main control room where Judah calls out the demon lurking inside. This is Winpei, and he looks kinda like he's in an unfinished, weakened state as he keeps repeating the word Manitou. Judah realizes that the demon isn't exactly ready for battle, but he also has to kill it anyway. Well, for a weakened demon, he's no pushover. Of course, as Judah, you're pretty safe, but you do need to make sure you're healing when necessary and using your demons properly. Unfortunately, despite beating Winpei pretty easily, Judah meets his end here as the demon hijacks the room's computer systems and blows the place apart. Shit. Well, we wake up back at HQ, and Nemissa wonders who Kinap is and what connection the airport has to what we're doing. No better way to answer that question, of course, than to explore it for ourselves. Like Algon NS, even though this is a repeat dungeon, there are a few new segments that we haven't seen before. Some of the enemies here hit pretty hard with physical attacks, so be sure you're on top of having an upgraded party and equipment. Throughout the dungeon, you hear Judah's voice, and as you progress, you sort of help him come to terms with what happened. I haven't really talked about music much in this game yet, but I really do like it for this dungeon specifically. It's another kind of somber, droning, ambient track. I've heard some people say that this game has one of the franchise's weaker soundtracks, and while they are right that it doesn't have too many iconic tracks like Nocturne's Fierce Battle or something like that, overall it holds up pretty well and contributes a consistently mysterious atmosphere to the dungeons. So, near the bottom of the dungeon, we hear an announcement about Finnegan beginning some sort of operation in the airport. Sure enough, go even further in, and there he is. If you were looking forward to fighting him, you're gonna have to wait a bit longer. He summons some demons, and then he fucking dips. Alrighty, guess we'll have to catch up later. This boss fight is essentially a test of how many types of moves you have access to. What I mean by that is, one demon highly resists physical, another resists a few magic types, and there are a variety of elemental weaknesses at play here. Basically, there's no one-size-fits-all approach, you can't just spam your strongest magic because it's not going to work for everyone. Once you figure out each demon's strength, it's a lot easier. For example, you don't want to use physical attacks on this gorilla guy, that's just going to waste your time. When you beat the demons, another summoner enters, and comments that Finnegan had a nice body. Oh really? Well, this is Sukeroku and he's Ray's partner. Now wait a second. Ray's partner. Where the fresh hell is the protagonist of the first game? And this guy even has the balls to say that his relationship with Ray is complicated? Man, get the hell out of here. Bring my man back. I can't believe it. Huh, <sighs> anyway, he kind of congratulates us, and then we get a call from Spooky saying that he struck a great deal for us to upgrade our comps. Basically, we just unlock access to a building where we can modify the comp a bit. Lunch decides to go with us, and outside the place, he has a bit of an argument with his father. Now, I found that none of the upgrades here are really that necessary. I actually never came back after this moment for the rest of the game, so make of that what you will. You got shit like restore HP with every step in dungeons, or increase the drop rate of rare items. Like, I get it, sounds good, but it just never seemed important to grab any of these. If you want to make the dungeons a little more convenient for you, I'd say check this place out, otherwise, it's no big deal. Outside the shop, we get a phone call from Mom. Oh shit, yeah, it's been a while since I went back to the house. Well, it's not good news. Tomiko, our sister, remember, seems to be stuck in some sort of trance. You know what that sounds like, huh? Sounds like she got her soul hacked. Yeah, let's take a drop by and see what we can do. 
So she's not looking too good. She's just kind of sitting there at the computer all lifeless. And what else is on the screen but that creepy ass VR art museum we checked out earlier. I knew it man, something's messed up about that place. The art museum is our next dungeon, and it is a long one. It's actually a handful of smaller dungeons, each with their own gimmick, all accessible through different paintings throughout the place. The first place we find is this painting of a dolphin, where we hear a girl's voice coming from inside. Hop in and you get this trippy ass movement where you're going forward but it doesn't really feel like you're moving at all. You can see a girl, that's Tomiko by the way, and a dolphin in the distance, but no matter how much you walk, you're just kinda stuck. With no other option, we gotta jump back out. Almost as soon as we're back in the museum gallery, this crazy dude called the Juggler comes up to us. You know, his voice acting is top notch. I don't really know how to explain it, but instead of sounding like he's reading some lines off a script, it's like you're actually talking to this guy. He really sells the wacky character he's playing as. Also, they got some weird audio like they recorded all of his lines in a public restroom. It's like he recorded them in some big empty room or something. No other character in the game sounds quite as convincing or odd as he does, and I gotta give him props for that. So he offers a way to save our sister, but we gotta play a game of chess with him first. In order to get the chess pieces we need, we've gotta explore a series of paintings and find them all. The first painting I went in was called Ghost Waterfall. It's this big ass cave that's actually behind a waterfall. Now the gimmick here is that you find these old dudes in certain parts, and one of them is lying about who has a key we need. I'm not really a fan of this kind of puzzle to be honest, they had it in Megami Tensei 2 also, and what it kind of amounts to is a lot of walking around, like first you gotta find each guy, then you gotta review what they're saying again and come up with which one's full of shit. I'll give it credit for at least not being just another average dungeon, but this is easily the weakest of the bunch if you ask me. I fought a lot of random encounters in here, and actually, one of my demons even abandoned the team. Didn't even know that could happen. As it turns out, if their loyalty goes low enough, they'll just leave, so be sure you're using your demons properly, or you might lose out on a pretty important party member. The next area just goes all out, it's straight up hell. Actually, it kind of reminds me of Sector H from Strange Journey. The puzzle here is a warp maze, and usually these are kind of frustrating, but this dungeon thankfully takes a different approach to it. So all around the place you find these weird little guys that speak in reverse. All you have to do is read what they're saying and you get hints on what teleports to take to advance further. I wonder how this worked in Japanese. As far as I'm aware you can't really write text backwards in Japanese, so they definitely had to change this for the English version. As long as you're following the hints, it's pretty simple. Except for one guy that tells you to think for yourself. Well, I did think for myself, and I chose the wrong teleporter, taking me all the way back to the start. The final area is this chess themed world. The puzzle here is to walk on a chess board following the pattern that a king piece would move. I don't know shit about chess, but thankfully the way forward is as simple as following little symbols on the floor. When you reach the end, you have to fight the juggler. I got hung up on this guy for a little bit. One of his moves prevents your party from using any sort of magic, so you need to make sure you have an item that can cure the mute status. Luckily, there are a couple items near the boss room. Make sure you can survive a couple turns without healing, because you might run out of those stones if you're not fast enough at beating him. Once the juggler goes down, you get the last chest piece. Of course, we're still not done, we still gotta save Tomiko. Now that we've taken care of all the other worlds, we should be able to make it further into the dolphin painting. Sure enough, head back in and we make it to Tomiko. The dolphin's here trying to convince her that the real world sucks and that she'd be better off just chilling in here for the rest of her life. This might be a pretty tense scene, but the dolphin's voice actor is using some goofy voice and he even squeaks, although it doesn't exactly sound like a real dolphin, it's some funny stuff. So we gotta fight this guy. It's actually a strange boss. When you attack, no matter what you do, nothing seems to actually deal any damage. The demon just absorbs everything, but as long as you keep hammering it with your best attacks, it does eventually go down, so I'm not sure exactly why it seems like you're doing nothing. Besides that, the fight's pretty short, and after beating the juggler, it's pretty simple. Back at home, Tomiko's all better, and things seem normal, except when you go in your room and dad's standing there staring up at the ceiling. Nice. Well, even though it seems like there's something seriously wrong with them, we can't do anything yet. But don't worry, it gets even worse. Next, out on the street, this weird hooded guy attacks us. It's Muwis, and he's got a new body. 
he really wants Numissa dead for some reason, and we've got no choice but to have ourselves a little surprise boss battle. During the fight, he'll spend some turns marking Numissa and focusing attacks on her, so if you just hit him with your best attacks and have Numissa guard, you shouldn't be in too much trouble. He actually never really managed to bring my health that low, so don't worry too much. If you get the chance though, you might want to make sure to save before this fight in case he does end up killing you, since it really sucked to have to retrace your steps from the last dungeon if you forgot to before. After you beat him, he runs away and drops some kind of metal piece on the ground. Nemissa wants to follow him and see what's up and how he knows her, and after talking to the guys back at base, it's decided that the pieces of his body must have come from a nearby automotive factory. This dungeon isn't quite as interesting as the VR art museum, but it's not too bad. It starts out with the whole place being really dark, with a low demon encounter rate. When the team finds the lights and turns them back on, none other than Ray herself makes an appearance, letting us know that we're pretty dumb for turning those lights back on, as it's going to bring out the demons. Of course. As I was exploring this place, I did take a little bit to grind actually. You never really need to grind in this game, but I was just feeling a little too weak. This is another place where you can tell the demons got a boost, and some of the demons can wreck your shit if you enter an encounter without full health. Some of the tougher demons are the Mad Gasser and this Headless Motorcycle guy. They got some big moves, so prioritize attacks on them when you find them. At the end of the dungeon we catch up to Muus again. This time he looks like fucking Bumblebee from Transformers or some shit. He actually spends most of the fight just charging up attacks, like for the first 4 or 5 rounds, Literally nothing happens, he's just watching you. After he's done though, out come the powerful moves, like Megidola, which can one-shot your character if you aren't ready for it. This fight took me a couple tries, you need to make sure you're guarding when necessary so you don't eat those strong attacks. If you lose the first couple times, you'll start to realize his pattern, and from there it's pretty simple. Just make good use of those first few turns where he doesn't do anything. After he dies, we get pulled into cyberspace along with them. Nemissa looks pretty freaked out and says something is entering her. Uh-huh, man, Nemissa, come on, you really gotta watch your wording there. Well, Muis appears in a new form and seems to finally realize that Nemissa has no idea what's going on. He explains that she's the one who governs death and again mentions Manitou, that same name the demon from the airport was yelling. Then he dies, like, for good this time, so we didn't learn too much. Back in the boss room, we see Ray again who talks to us for a bit, and mentions that she can sense two souls within Hitomi's body, kind of like the protagonist of the first game in Kyoji Kuzunoa. She urges us to visit someone named Madame Ginko if we're dead set on fighting the Phantom Society. Ginko is looking a little different in this game. Guess a lot can happen in a few years. Well, she gives us some advice on the Phantom Society, like letting us know that they've been controlling the world secretly for a long time. She also gives us access to Sword Fusion, which to be honest, I completely ignored for the rest of the game didn't use it once. Basically, how it works though is you can fuse a demon in the sword to create a special weapon. It looks like it can be pretty helpful, so if you're stuck on a particular boss or enemy, I would say check it out, but this is another one of those things that doesn't really matter if you're running with a solid team. After returning to base, we see a message on the summoner net from Finnegan. He wants to settle things one on one, and has captured Yuichi to make sure we actually show up. He's on this artificial island type thing called the Amami Float, and after taking a shuttle at the airport to get to it, we're in our next dungeon. The Amami Float stretches all the way up to like 13 floors, but luckily we skip over a lot of them by using elevators. There's nothing too special about this place, it's basically just a big setup for an interesting boss battle. You'll come across Yuichi's hat as you explore, which is never a good sign, and eventually Finnegan himself in a storeroom. So here's the deal with this boss fight, it can play out two ways. One option is going summoner versus summoner, which means you don't use Nemissa for this fight. The other is to say screw that and just hit him with everything you have, Nemissa included. The version of the fight without Nemissa was pretty tough for me. See, as I've mentioned a few times, she's an absolute powerhouse. At best, my protagonist is like an accessory to her, there to mop up weak enemies, use items, switch demons, stuff like that. The demons Finnegan summons in this fight are exactly the same as yours, so if you know all your strengths and weaknesses, it shouldn't be too bad. I'd probably place the protagonist in the back row for this fight if possible, just because it only takes one bad hit to end the entire thing. If you choose to fight him with Nemissa, he uses different demons which might be a little stronger than your current party. The thing is, with her magic it's no trouble at all, so it's definitely the easier of the two options if you ask me. 
No matter which one you choose, eventually Finnegan goes down and runs away, and we save Yuichi. Except, he's acting a little weird. Granted, he did just get kidnapped, but you know, something just isn't right about him. Six also fucking tears into him for being reckless enough to get kidnapped, I mean he goes hard. Afterwards, everyone goes their separate ways for a while to rest. When we get back to base later, we get a message notifying us that our Amami City ID has been deleted. Guess that's what you get for humiliating members of the Japanese Demon Illuminati. Well obviously that's not going to work for us if we want to keep exploring the city, so we gotta get all the help we can. First, we decided to go check on Six after his little outburst. Find his house, walk into his room, and shit. He's got gaming sickness just like Tomiko did. Once again, it's a problem with Paradigm X, and the only way to snap him out of it is to go in there ourselves. On the way out, we also see Lunch arguing with his dad again. He mentions a computer chip going missing from the factory he works at, and blames Lunch for stealing it. So anyway, the next dungeon is the VR Haunted Mansion, which is actually somehow less terrifying than the art museum was. When you go in, you get this weird old man who paints the scenario of this place for you. There's a young kid who brought forth some kind of demon which is taking control of him. Of course, the kid in question is none other than Six. Essentially, this dungeon will take us through his memories as we try to figure out what's bothering him. As you walk around the place, you hear the voice of Six's sister, who seems really bossy and controlling. The dungeon itself is essentially broken into three smaller teleport mazes and one big basement floor where you'll end up if you take the wrong warps. Depending on how lucky you are, this dungeon can take anywhere from 20 minutes to a couple hours. I opted to explore nearly the entire basement floor thinking there was something important down there, but aside from a few extra treasures, there ain't shit. This is probably my least favorite dungeon gameplay wise. Unless I was missing some kind of hint, it was mostly just a big guessing game, and the mansion itself is kinda bland. The battle backgrounds are pretty cool though, I mean it looks like a Hawaiian t-shirt or something. As you reach the end of each section, you get a cutscene about Six's childhood. The choices you make in here determine how the dungeon's boss plays out, which I kinda lucked out on because I ended up choosing the options that made it easier. Essentially, you run into Six doing something and you have the option either leave him alone or pull him out of the memory. If you leave him, the cutscene ends shortly after and the boss goes a little easier on you. I'm not sure what happens if you take him out, I didn't actually try it, but the more you do that, the more help the boss gets. Six's sister features prominently in each cutscene, and one of the last ones, you see him standing there holding a bleeding doll, okay? And as it turns out, the doll represents his sister, who he accidentally killed by pushing down the stairs. Holy shit! I didn't quite expect it to get so dark. Well, the only way Six is gonna get over this is if he stops thinking about what happened so much. So, his sister is the boss fight. Funnily enough, even on her easiest form, I died to her a couple times. She's got some powerful magic, and if you aren't ready for it, it can kinda just blow you away. This is another one of those fights where if you lose once or twice, you got it the next time because it isn't actually that hard. Just make sure you can resist electricity attacks, and you should be okay. When she goes down, Six kinda realizes that just because he made a mistake, doesn't mean he has to think about it constantly, and that he can remember his sister without obsessing over what happened. When everyone gets back to the HQ, Leader starts to notice that the Phantom Society's operations and this weird sickness trance thing that people keep entering are almost certainly related, and that it seems like they're after people's souls. In the middle of the conversation, we get interrupted. Yep, it's another surprise boss fight. This is my own, another dark summoner. To be honest, just go hard with your best moves. It's kinda like the surprise moves fight where it's not exactly difficult, but it does take you off guard. Oh yeah, and she doesn't run away after the fight or something, she fucking dies. But not before dropping a bomb and blowing the entire parking garage straight to hell. Luckily, everyone makes it out, albeit a little shaken up. For the rest of the game, the Spookies trailer moves to a different area of the city, but otherwise things continue as normal. So next up, I'm actually going to show you guys a little side quest. Now this game has a few side quests, but you need to be checking up on what people are seeing around town and in Paradigm X, or you're going to miss them. I actually missed a few side quests throughout the game, and once you progress in the story past a certain point, you may not be able to access them again until New Game Plus. There's one where you go to the highway and fight demons or something that I totally missed, and there's even a questline involving Mary at the fusion place, which I would have liked to see, but I just didn't know about it, and I didn't talk to her enough to find out. Luckily, I did manage to catch what I consider to be one of the craziest dungeons in all of Megaton. The Primate Intelligence Labs. Yeah, we're gonna go play with fucking monkeys. 
You find some kind of intel online that says Dr. Thrill is holed up in this place, so let's go find him. The monkey labs suck absolute ass if you don't have a spell or item to reduce enemy encounters. When I say this shit's every step, I mean it is every step. There are so many encounters in here, it's unreal. And it's all really weak enemies, so it's mostly just there to waste your time. You can use these to grind magnetite though if you need it. Throughout the labs, you get these different logic puzzles that you have to guess correctly or it warps you back. I think they might be random, not sure. Some of them are really easy and some were math. I don't fuck with math, so I got those wrong a couple times. You also have like 10 seconds to answer the question or it just marks you wrong. Now, the puzzles are one thing, but the boss of this dungeon is really where it just goes out the window. So you find Dr. Thrill, and he's got this 3000 IQ monkey here ready to beat your ass. He even tells a Yo Mama joke. Yeah, that's right. There's a Megami Tensei game where a monkey insults your mother. Now the boss fight isn't even really a fight at first, it's just a bunch of riddles. You gotta answer a few of these correct in a row, or he just leaves in disgust and you have to walk all the way back to try again. There's a pretty big pool of questions you can choose from. Some of them you can kind of figure out, some are just totally confusing, but at least you only have four options to choose from. When you finally manage to figure these out, then it turns into a traditional battle, which is simple enough, though you definitely want to make sure not to mess it up and have to do all that over again. I gotta say, as far as side quests go, that was really something. If the other ones are anything like this, I'll definitely be sure to do them when I eventually play through this game again. Alright, with that out of the way, we gotta find our next main story dungeon. So we get a call from Tomiko about our dad. He's gone a little crazy, and apparently he's down at the mall participating in some sort of riot. Nice. Sure enough, the place is filled with these shifty looking people all over. I'm sure here in Amami City this is probably out of the ordinary, but to be honest, if you've ever been to Walmart or something in America, well, you're probably used to shit like this. If you talk to some of these people, Hitomi even gets a little freaked out. Now think about that for a second. Hitomi is more afraid of these people than she is of actual creatures born in the fires of hell. Anyway, to progress through the dungeon and figure out what's going on, we need access to the mall warehouse. And all we have to do is just find a key in here, which is easy enough. The warehouses have a nice little puzzle where if you flip a switch, a certain color door will open, but then you gotta go back and flip a different switch to open another door, and basically just find a path through. Soon enough, we come across Dad in some kind of weird cryogenic stasis control room. Sukeroku is here too, and he advises that we investigate something called Crypto, which is a special type of computer chip found in devices across the city. Well, if we've learned anything, it's that all of this strange behavior is 100% caused by using computers in the city. Later on, we take apart a crypto chip at HQ, and a weird ball of light comes out that only Namisa and Yuichi can see. If we're gonna find out what's up with this, there's no better place to look than the place the chips are manufactured, Algon Microelectronics. This is a big ass dungeon. It doesn't have any frustrating gimmicks or anything, it's just gonna take you a little while. Especially if you're the kind of person that doesn't leave any stone unturned. Eventually, everyone makes it to the room where the chips are manufactured, except as Launch's dad points out who conveniently shows up, the core of the chip is only shipped to this factory. Launch's dad reveals that he's been playing along with the conspiracy to keep his family safe, but that if we're set on fighting against the Phantom Society, he can help us out a bit. He says that we can find more information in the center room upstairs. This is basically where the game does the big bomb drop and just unloads the entire conspiracy onto you, so if you don't want to hear about that, well, this is your warning. But I bet you've already kind of figured it out anyway. The Spookies break into the computer and learn that the crypto chip has the special ability to steal human souls, and that through an internet connection, all users in Amami City are eligible to have their souls harvested. It's actually quite a long cutscene, and it only leaves us with one question. How exactly are the chip cores being manufactured? Well, we don't have time to think of that for long because we're interrupted again. A suited man enters and transforms into Shemyaza. This guy can hit hard with fire, ice, and electricity, and he can inflict status effects. You want to be sure you aren't weak to any of these, and bring your best demons and moves. Fuse demons as high as you can go, and bring some HP recovery items. If you get in a pinch and it misses at low health, Nothing's better than just using a beat with the protagonist to get her back to full. If you manage to beat him, then the Spookies escape and decide to come up with a plan to deal with this whole soul hacking thing. Leader comes up with an idea to upload a virus into Paradigm X, which would expose all of its users to the truth. 
which seems like a huge task by the way, but he's confident that it can be pulled off. Unfortunately, things don't quite go as planned, and instead of exposing Algonsoft, we end up being exposed as net terrorists on live television. Well, shit. We also get a message from Kadokura, one of Algonsoft's executives, mocking leader for his attempt. Kadokura also refers to Spooky as an employee, so... Was Leader actually working with Algonsoft the entire time? And was this all just a big ass lie to expose us? The game leaves it up to you to decide whether or not you trust him. Everyone else basically bails out, and things aren't looking too good for him, despite his claims of being innocent. Well, I mean, come on, Leader's cool, right? He wouldn't do that. So I decided to stay with him. Framing our Leader is a solid plan on the villain's part, and it did work for most of the team, but we can't just abandon him without knowing for 100% sure. So HQ's mostly empty now that everyone's a wanted fugitive, but we know Kadokura has something to do with it, so it's better than nothing. Now just when you thought it couldn't get any more confusing, Kinap shows up again and decides to pull us into another vision quest, marking our third and final adventure into the past. Maybe we can finally get some concrete info on who the fuck he is, where these chip cores are coming from, or like a thousand other things that are still kind of unclear. This quest is basically the beginning of the end. The things we do here are directly going to influence the final boss. Now you'll see how in a minute. So we get this nice cutscene intro to a Chinese restaurant, and then we're inside with Nishi of Algonsoft and a female summoner. This is Naomi, and we're going to be stepping into her shoes for a bit. She's on a mission to clear out a demon that's living in ruins beneath the city. There are actually two demons, Tiamat and Apsu, but only one needs to be killed to satisfy Nishi. As you explore as Naomi, first you'll notice she doesn't roll with any demons, and quite frankly, she's OP as shit. This lady has moves that literally should not exist, including a spell that fully restores her HP and MP and costs like 4 MP to cast. She can kick the teeth in of any demon you come across and dodges most of their attacks. Soon enough, you reach a dark lower floor of the ruins and the boss is nearby. Now, I chose to fight Tiamat. Like I said, the game doesn't exactly tell you this right away, but your choice here determines which version of the final boss you fight bit. If you choose Tiamat, the final boss is a magic type, which means he resists spells and relies more on casting for his attacks. If you fight Apsu, He's a physical type, so he uses powerful physical attacks at the cost of being weaker to magic. I wouldn't sweat this too much, each form is perfectly doable. If you tend to run powerful physical attackers or something, you might want to keep it in mind or else your party is going to be significantly weaker if you end up with a version of the boss that resists your best attacks. Tiamat is basically impossible to lose against. Just spam your best moves and use that godlike recovery spell anytime your health or magic get low. I assume Apsu works the same way. When she goes down, everything looks good to go, except Naomi ends up being trapped in the room as the air seemingly turns to poison. Unfortunately, as with all vision quests, she dies at the end, but we now know something big is going down in the ruins. She really should have just cast that spell again. Kinap reflects that in this situation, both the god and the human were killed, seemingly incompatible with living together in harmony. He seems to think that no matter what happens, man and god are simply never going to be able to find peace. He says that Manitou, deep within the earth, hides away, knowing it's incompatible with mankind. One of the two has to go. You remember Manitou, right? You know, the name certain demons like Muus would scream about from time to time? Well, as human beings, or members of mankind, I guess it's our calling to fight against that kind of force. Kinda sad though if you think about it. I mean, I still don't exactly get what Manitou is, but it doesn't seem like it's causing all these problems on purpose. Well, back at base, Leader tries another hack to set things right, this time into the Soul Transfer Network. But again, Kadokura stops us. Guess we're gonna have to pay him a little visit. Outside the building, there's a huge ass force field, and it looks like some crazy shit's going on inside. Guess they decided to start the party without us. Instead of using the front door, Nemissa finds a way to transport us in through a computer, going into Paradigm X and popping out directly inside the building. Nice. The Algon main building can play out a couple ways. Almost as soon as it starts, we run into Finnegan, except this time, he's not out for blood. He offers a temporary truce. You do have the option to deny him and complete the dungeon totally solo, but if you join up, he solves like half the dungeon's puzzles for you, and gives you some extra information right off the bat. I opted to side with him because even though he's kind of a dick, Finnegan is pretty cool. 
So he tells us that a demon is going crazy inside the Paradigm X network, and everything's going to hell fast. The demon turned Algon's main building into a virtual world, and placed a giant barrier over top of it, placing him in full control. To advance further, we've got to undo a few seals placed throughout the dungeon. Finnegan takes one color, you take the other. So you fight your way through, solving puzzles, doing your thing, until you run into Finnegan again, and uh, he's not looking too good. Someone named Malsum managed to get the best of him by sealing his demon's magic, and as he dies, he wonders why Manitou created such destructive demons. He says that only if Nemissa were here, maybe Manitou could be stopped. Wait a second, he, he, he doesn't know, does he? Shit, she was right here the entire time. Well, it's a good thing we've got our own little secret weapon with us. Malsum is another decent challenge. As Finnegan said, he can silence you, meaning your spells aren't going to do anything and you'll have to waste some time fixing that status effect, which can be fatal if you aren't able to heal after a particularly strong attack. Weirdly enough, this guy also made the emulator lag pretty bad, so I guess he was trying to kill me in real life too. One of his attacks, Algazona, only hits particular slots in your party, and it does some heavy damage. If you put a demon in slots 2, 4, and 6 that reflect physical, he's practically going to kill himself. Be sure not to have the protagonist in any of those spots either, or you'll probably get wiped out. After the fight, things aren't looking much better. Hitomi has been possessed by Nemissa for so long that her personality starts to fade away, and then back at base, Yuichi's demonic looking ass says that all of our team has been kidnapped and taken to the Amami monolith. Listen, I called this from the very start, like hours ago. Ever since he got kidnapped, dude was not right, and nobody seemed to notice. He's under Algon's control right now, and if you recall, the Shadow Society were the ones who kidnapped him in the first place, so I guess it all kinda adds up. Anyway, Ray shows up to take care of him while we go check out the monolith. This is the penultimate dungeon of the main story, and it is very long. First order of business is to find our friends. Basically, the dungeon's divided into two sections, left and right. We find lunch on one side and six on the other. Now each side stretches pretty high up. When you find your crew members, they help you solve a puzzle in which you have to input the password for each section of the dungeon to unlock its corresponding elevator. If it sounds confusing, it's really not, and what it amounts to is listening to what the password is for each section, and then flipping a series of switches that spell out that word. If anything, it's just time consuming. In one room, you run into Kadokura, who kind of seems, well, broken. He admits that Nishi is the mastermind behind everything that's been going on, so big surprise there, and that he's a member of the Phantom Society. Basically, he sells Nishi up a river, and then kind of just hangs around in this room. Sort of anticlimactic considering how big he was talking earlier. Nishi's found shortly after. He gives you his little villain speech and then transforms into Azazel, who's pretty standard, honestly. He can hit hard with physical attacks, and he can use buffs, so if you have items, spells, or demons that reflect physical, it's even easier. Just buff your defense, debuff his attack, and it should be over quick. As he dies, he says that it's only the start of a never-ending battle, again failing to answer a lot of questions we have about Nemissa. We really do tend to kill these guys before we get anything good out of them. Well, onto the roof of the building then. We've got everyone accounted for, except Leader. We get to the top, and Leader's acting weird. Turns out, he's been possessed by Satanael, who kinda just yanks him up into the air and forces him to fight. You fucker. Now, Satanael's no pushover compared to Nishi. He's got hard-hitting magic, most of which hits the entire party. This fight was actually where I discovered a new strategy, which kinda breaks the game. No shit, check this out. Nemissa has a spell called Necroma. I'm pretty sure this thing's in other games too, but I've never tried it. I kinda got desperate during this fight. So what Necroma does is revive a dead demon as a zombie. They function almost the exact same as a normal demon, except if they get hit by any of your healing magic, they instantly die. They're also very vulnerable to the instant kill Hama line of spells. Besides that though, they're invulnerable. Yeah, for real, there is no boss out there that heals you, and hardly any that use Hama spells, so basically, zombie demons are for all intents and purposes, totally invincible. And as cheesy as it may be, that's how I beat this boss. Get a guy with buff spells, let him die, use Necroma, and you've got an invincible demon just spam buffs on your side. That shit's crazy, man. I almost couldn't believe how broken it was. 
Granted, you still have to keep your protagonist alive, but it's much easier when you have a team of zombie demons that you can essentially ignore for the rest of the fight. When Satanile goes down, well, leader's not gonna make it. The fight really fucked him up, but we had no other option. It's actually a pretty sad scene for what's mostly an otherwise lighthearted game. I was surprised they killed off a Spooky's member, I just didn't see it coming, and it was a lot more emotional because of that. As he's dying, all of a sudden Kadokuro runs in and freaks the hell out because we've ruined his plan. Manitou needs more souls, and we can't get in the way of that. We meet Kina once more in a weird vision as he explains that he's the last of the spirits who lived in harmony with Earth. He explains that Manitou is a pure spirit with no sense of self or soul, and that when mankind bothers it, well, it bothers mankind back. A lot of the demons we've seen came forth from Manitou as it became angry, determined to kill anything that can threaten it. As it turns out, Nemissa is another demon born from Manitou, but she has the power to end things. Now, Manitou as a villain is pretty interesting because, like I said before, he's not really evil on purpose. It's like mankind's nature infected it, and as a result, it kinda just copies the way people are, which is, well, sometimes violent. As for why the Phantom Society is bothering Manitou and stealing souls, I don't really know, it's still not that clear to me, and to be honest, by the end of the game, aside from getting power, I guess, I don't really know what Nishi and Kadokuro really wanted. Nonetheless, it's a pretty unique entity sort of thing to go up against, and we'll be seeing him very shortly. The only thing left to do is to track down Kadokura and Manitou and get this over with. Yuichi's also feeling a bit better, so the group decides to ask Lunch's dad for one last favor. He reveals that the ship cores are coming from a building east of the Amami monolith, which leads to an underground facility. The city's kinda gone to shit, so we better hurry up. The last dungeon is the very same ruins we were at with Naomi, except this time, they're a lot harder. As you go deeper, the place gets progressively darker, and it's kinda got a freaky atmosphere like you're going to the center of the earth or something. You can find some good items down here, like armor that'll help you out with the final boss. Make sure to explore this place fully, because you're probably not gonna come back for a long time, if ever. Even though this is the last main story dungeon, it's by no means the hardest or longest, and it doesn't even really have that many gimmicks or things that are gonna piss you off. Eventually, you find this big thing in a huge room with Kadokuro looming above. We gotta beat him before we can get to Manitou. He transforms and the boss starts. So his biggest attack is this move called Ultimate Laser, and it can really mess you up if you've got your protagonist in the front row. The fight is pretty much trivialized if you make use of the zombies I was talking about earlier. Place a group of three zombies in the front, and that's pretty much it, you can't get hurt. Of course, he's totally doable without that strategy, but the laser is almighty damage, so you can't reflect it or anything. The most important thing you want to do here is keep your team in good shape as you start to wear him down, because Manitou starts immediately after with no break between. So, Kadokura falls, and out comes our final boss. Look at this guy, I just find his design so interesting. Like, what is he supposed to be? He's almost impossible to describe. Like, a human with weird spider appendages or something? Except, that's not really right at all. I don't know, he's just strange, like this opposite version of a human or something that we're struggling to comprehend. Anyway, as I mentioned before, he has two possible forms, and this is his magic form. He acts twice per turn, and then after that, does nothing for a single turn. Then he goes twice again, so you get a nice break between some potentially devastating attacks. Just be sure to debuff him and stuff, and you should be okay. Manitou has a move called Armageddon that's kinda scary because basically it halves your health, which isn't so bad, but if he decides to cast an almighty spell on his second turn, it can wipe out a lot of your team. So be sure you're always running with the highest health you can manage. As long as you're actively healing, buffing, and debuffing, you should get through this guy pretty much fine. When he finally goes down, Nemissa realizes that humans and demons just can't live together. That's just the way it is, unfortunately. To finish things once and for all, she has to return to Manitou so he can finally fade away. She closes her eyes, leaves Atomi's body, and changes back to her original form. Then everything disappears, and she's gone. Fuck man, I'm not crying or anything. And that's the end of the game. 
You do get some post-credit cutscenes about what happened to the Spookies, like for example, Lunch decides to become a reporter, Six moves away, and Yuichi decides to stay as a hacker, but yeah, that's basically it for the main story. I gotta say, it was a fun, interesting, and often strange little adventure, but I'm never gonna forget it, and I enjoyed almost every minute of it. It's the perfect length, in my opinion, to tell a story without overstaying its welcome. The game's only about 20 hours long, if that, and you barely have to do any grinding or anything frustrating to reach the end. Now ordinarily, this is where the video would end, you know, since the game's over, but this one is a little special in that it has a lot of post-game content. So instead of just cutting things off here, let's check that out before we call it quits. Now trust me, it's worth it. We're gonna say hi to some familiar faces, and also become reacquainted with the definition of pain as they mercilessly beat the shit out of us. Ironically, this being the shortest game I've played on the channel, it's also the longest video, but hey, this shit's cool, so why not? So, load up your post-game save and you're back in the city before the game ended. You get a message about a new room opening at the top of the Sea Arc. Now, I didn't talk about the Sea Arc at all, but basically, it's an extra dungeon that progressively has more rooms unlocked as you progress through the game. You can go here to train or recruit demons, but the big shit is up here in floor 11, which is only unlocked after you beat Manitou. So stroll in, take the elevator up, and we get whisked away to the corridor of time. Interestingly enough, this is how you unlock New Game Plus. Yeah, beating the game isn't enough, you actually have to fight for the right to reverse time, and it's kind of incorporated into the story, it's pretty interesting. Essentially, what the Corridor of Time boils down to is a handful of micro dungeons and bonus bosses. The dungeons themselves are very easy and hardly worth talking about. They each have a little gimmick, but I'd be surprised if each one took you longer than 10 or 15 minutes. On the other hand, the bosses are much more interesting. So let's have a tiny marathon and run through each one. The first guy is King Frost, who's the easiest of the bunch. Except for one little trick he pulls that fucks you up. Besides the shit you'd expect from him, like ice attacks and all that, as he's about to die, he can use a suicide move that kills both himself and your entire party. When his health gets low, be ready for that, or you're gonna have to do it all over again. The next boss is none other than Mara. Oh shit. And his voice actor sounds like Doug Dimidome. I'd really like to see the notes they handed to this guy, like, yeah, you know dicks, right? You're a giant green dick. Knock yourself out. Mara relies on powerful physical moves, which if you can reflect them, means the fight is incredibly easy. There aren't any super devious tricks to look out for, so he's mostly standard fare. After that is Lilith, who can charm your party and put them to sleep, and also cast almighty spells. Just be aware of those ailments and try to have a team that nulls them, or items to quickly get rid of them. Charm is always a problem and can be frustrating to deal with if it hits, but otherwise, Lilith should pose no big threat. Then you've got Lucifuge. He's a joke, really. He can attack twice per turn, but honestly, he should be ashamed of himself because the fight is very easy. The final boss is Beelzebub. Now this is a bit of a challenge to deal with. As you explore his little dungeon, be sure you grab the Hino Kagetsuchi. This is the best sword in the game, and it hits every enemy on the field at once, which is really going to help you speed up some future encounters. Beelzebub hits hard, he can shock you, and if he does shock you, he's got a move to instant kill you. There's a lot to look out for here. Also, his health is over 65,000. Yeah. For reference, I don't think any boss prior to this comes close to even like a third of that. What the hell, man? I mean, there's nothing worse than slowly wearing this guy down only to mess up, get killed, and have to work through that absolute mountain of health over again. I even resorted to gambling to try to speed this up. Yeah, you thought I'd play a Mega 10 game without gambling, right? The casino in Paradigm X, which I didn't go to until Beelzebub, has some great items and equipment for boss battles. Unfortunately, the computer's a cheating fuckhead and you almost never win, so that's kind of out the window. Eventually, I discovered a strategy that absolutely breaks this fight, and I'm convinced it was solely designed to get past this. Some demons have a spell called Judgment, which highly damages enemies if they have a Law or Chaos alignment. Beelzebub, being the king of hell, is Chaos aligned. Bring this move in and holy shit, it does over 10,000 per hit. Granted, the number slowly goes down, I think it takes like an eighth per hit off of his health, but it vastly speeds up the battle, 
and basically makes it trivial. When you finally beaten all 5 bosses, you unlock the ability to reverse time and now you can surely begin New Game Plus. Whew, okay, well, we're still not done, yeah. There's another bonus dungeon, this one with an even harder ultimate boss. You know, of course, right? So on the main menu, you can choose this option labeled Extra Game. Choose a file to load from and it warps you into yet another corridor of time type place. Great. The format is exactly the same too. Five more bosses, five more mini dungeons. Well, we're not gonna get it done just sitting here. Let's go. The bosses here are actually really cool, so I do highly recommend playing the bonus dungeon once you beat the game. Check it out. The first boss is Inui. This is a random guy from the first Devil Summoner game, and it was crazy to see him come back. His squad of soldiers hits you with a move that will bring your HP to 1 at the cost of most of their health bar. Essentially, this fight is just a test of how quickly you can set up a reflect physical. I think you have to reflect physical to beat this, so be sure you have an item or spell for it. Inui's big move is yet another suicide thing that blows your shit away, so get ready for it because it's coming fast. Another boss is none other than Sid Davis, the main antagonist of the first game. What? I mean, that's crazy, come on, what a cameo. Sid is a bit stronger than he was in his own game, and summons a party of demons exactly identical to your own. Know your strengths and weaknesses, and you'll get through the battle. Or just spam almighty attacks. He doesn't have much health himself, so after you beat your own party, it's only a matter of time before he goes down. Nice seeing you again, Sid. Now, not all the bosses are this interesting. A few are just normal ass demons that don't even really have much more health than a random encounter. You had a couple demons that don't appear in the main story, like Palace Athena, but yeah, these are really easy. I killed some of them in a single attack from the Hino Kagetsuchi. You might be thinking, Marshall, these things are all easy as hell, so what's the big idea with the bonus dungeon? Well, don't worry. The next and final, for real this time, boss I'm going to show you will have you screaming for mercy if you aren't giving it 120% with the best party, highest stats, and smartest strategies you can muster. Yeah, for real, I ain't messing around. I spent like 12 hours on this last group of bosses alone, no shit. That's why this video took so long, because I got my ass handed to me over and over and over. You better get a look for yourself. The beginning of this game's fucked up grand finale is none other than the first game's protagonist. For the sake of convenience, I'm just gonna call him Kyoji, but for the record, depending on a choice you made at the end of the first game, this may or may not be his real name. Kyoji is a straight up demon. He kicks ass, I mean it. The other bosses I just blew through, like no trouble, some as easy as a single turn. Well guess what? Kyoji will kill your ass in a single turn. It took me so long to beat him. His party has almost any move you can think of, and each demon is very strong. If you can resist their magical attacks, it's still totally possible that they can cast no less than three almighty attacks before you even get a chance to react. If your level isn't somewhere between like 78 to 99, I don't think you have a chance at all. Your demons also need to be upgraded to be able to withstand that much damage. Get the best shit you can find. Spend a while at the fusion place going as high as you can manage, and then maybe go a little bit higher. I tried this fight immediately after beating the ones I mentioned before, and I got clapped in one turn. Came back with better demons, got clapped in one turn. Came back with a few more levels, got clapped in one turn. I had to resort to Mitama fusion, which basically is where you fuse two demons of the same type to make an elemental, then two elementals to make a Mitama, and when you fuse a Mitama to a demon, it boosts their stats considerably. I had to do this to my demons to survive the initial onslaught, and to ensure that their agility was high enough to potentially attack or heal first. Fuck man, all I can say is good luck. The only way I could win was through luck and hours of fusion and upgrading. So Kyoji goes down, but it's not over. Not even close. None other than Raido Kuzunoha comes out with his cat Goto. I gotta say, the voice acting is pretty weird to hear. Never thought I'd hear what these guys actually supposedly sound like. They even kept Kyoji as a silent protagonist, but for some reason, not Raido. Anyway, at first he has mercy on you and brings out a selection of powerful demons. This fight really isn't too bad, but you need to be careful anyway. They can charm you and hit you with strong physical attacks multiple times apiece, and if you mess up here, you have to fight Kyoji again. So don't mess up. No pressure. If you manage to beat this part, 
another Raido appears and they take the gloves off and decide to double team your ass. This fight is hard. They really do go all the way on this one. There's just so much going on here and if you aren't always at peak health, you can easily get melted. It almost feels like fighting against another player. The demons that the Raidos use have synergy, they play off of each other. One might mark you, the other one follows up with an instant kill attack. I was able to get through this by relying on physical attack reflection and trying to stun some of the demons. If you can manage to shock one, then that's one guy you have to worry less about for that turn. If you have both physical reflection and a way to stun people, you might even want to consider avoiding specifically shocking the Raidos because with their strong attacks, they can actually kill themselves if it bounces off of you. Of course, this is easier said than done and requires a bit of luck. I lost to these guys a good few times, and each time, that was another fight with Kyoji. It really starts to break you, man. If you beat this, God have mercy on your soul because there's one last fight. And, well, it's a giant fucking robot, the soulless god Omagatsu. Yeah, Solus is right. Whoever made this is definitely lacking one. This shit. I don't even know where to start. I'm sure some of you are out there like, Damn, Marsh, just get good, man. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm trying. Omagatsu, again, has over 65,000 health, and this time, Judgment won't save you. He can move twice per turn, has a very high agility stat, meaning he acts before your party in most cases. His attacks hit hard, and he can inflict a bomb status on you, immediately following it up with a powerful fire attack which kills you instantly. This is one hell of an ultimate boss. All I can say is your party needs to be built to the absolute max, and you need to be prepared for anything. Once you get a rhythm down of healing, buffing, debuffing, attacking, and all that, you're basically just going to be doing the same thing for a while. Buff up your magic and cast almighty because you can do some heavy damage that way. It's long, hard, and nasty, but that's just the way Atlas likes it. If you can manage to beat all these fights, no sweat, I'll make out with you, no shit. I've seen people beat these in less than 20 minutes, and I'm guessing it just comes down to grinding, but man, what a way to send you off, right? Well, this is the last, hardest challenge of the game, bringing us to the end of the Soul Hackers experience. Like I was saying before, this game's great, I really liked it. It's a shame I waited so long to play it, because it might even be my favorite Mega 10 game at the moment. Something about the atmosphere and mechanics just really made it unforgettable for me, and I'd love to see another game like this someday. It's crazy that they didn't localize the original Devil Summoner, considering how much this one references it, but I guess that's just how it is. I highly recommend you play this if you haven't. I'd say play it blind, but well, if you're here and you haven't played it, it's a little too late for that. Nonetheless, you will almost certainly have fun with this game if you like other classic Mega Ten titles. I'd definitely give this game an A tier ranking, or maybe even an S, just because I had a lot of fun with it. Hope you guys enjoyed the video, I know it's a long one, but hey, it's worth it. Let me know what you think in the comments below, I'd love to hear what you guys think about the game too. As always, I'll see you guys in the next video.